this was a topic that I seem to have talked yesterday about uh, at least five times and then a sixth time at about nine o'clock last night with Mike Hall, we talked a little bit about this. So, you know, I just decided that this would probably just be a great topic for, for everybody, whether you're a new agent, whether you've been around for six months, whether you've been around two years or you've been around six years, a lot of times it's good for us to remember that we need to wear our, our field hat, our field underwriting cap, right? So when we're making dials and we're scheduling appointments, that is one of the hard parts of what we do, yes? Then it comes to the time where we get somebody on the telephone and then we're converting them over to a video. And now it's our time to make a connection. Now, there's two ways to look at what we do. One of the first ways that we can look at what we do is, we can look at this as we're in sales. Maybe this is direct sales. And I would agree with that statement. I would agree that at some point, in some capacity, what we're doing is a sales process. And don't be ashamed of that. Um, I love that word sales because quite frankly, the ones who make the most money in America are typically in the sales profession. To be proud, I would be proud of the fact that I'm in this form of sales, right? I'm not going door to door. We're not, you know, we're not soliciting people. We're not cold calling people, but there is a form of sales that's involved in what we do. Even more importantly, there's field underwriting, which is probably 97% of what we do. Make no mistake about it. We are the eyes and the ears for the in-house underwriting department. And just that statement that I made right there, being the eyes and the ears for the in-house underwriting department, that is something I tell my clients. So when I'm talking to a client, I let them know, I am the eyes and I am the ears for the in-house underwriting department. All of a sudden now, now you've separated yourself from somebody who they may believe is here to sell me something as opposed to somebody who's here to do their job to find out, am I eligible for this coverage that I wanted to apply for? And just that little separator right there. A lot of times I come on here and I talk a lot about magic words and I talk about language. Guys, let's be very clear about this. When you have somebody either on video or you're talking face to face to them, it doesn't matter how you're talking to the person what matters is the language that you're using in order to get their attention, right? Does, do I have everybody's attention here this morning, right? Nod your head, right? If I've got everybody's attention, right? Why? Because it's the language that we use. And that language needs to be completely and 100% utterly hammered in to our client's brain. And here's what I mean. I talked about this yesterday with a few agents and I said this, I said, you know, when we're talking to a client, you need to be a hammer. And I don't mean like hammer somebody over the head in a rude way, because there's no way for us to be able to close a deal out or make a connection with the client. If we're hammering people, if we're treating them a certain way, if we're not speaking to them in a respectful way, that's not what I'm talking about. When I talk about, you need to hammer people. Here's what I mean. When I'm in the field and I'm hammering somebody, I'm hammering them in a way that I'm going to have a certain type of conversation with another adult that most people are never going to have with this adult in their lifetime. See, at the end of the day, what we do matters. And in order for us to truly get the client to tell us why they need the coverage, it has to go even deeper even deeper than, uh, than us just asking them, well, give me an idea. How long would it take before the bank starts calling and they start sending nasty letters and all of a sudden, now it becomes a stressful situation for you. About how long is that time frame? Has to go deeper than that. Okay, so that's gonna take six months, you tell me. Okay, I think it's probably closer to 90 days, but if you think it's gonna take six months, then what does that look like? What happens when the sheriff's department shows up and puts a bright orange sticker on your front door? What does that look like then for you? Okay, so then you'd have to probably leave your home, okay? And you said that your kids are in high school. 
And would you be moving close to the high school or would you be moving across town? Oh, you'd be moving out of state to your sister's house. Okay, does she know that? <laughs> right, do they know that? Do they know that you and your spouse and the kids and the cats and everybody's coming to move at the sister's house? So, right, so now I'm digging a little bit deeper and I'm trying to find the pain. But that's, even, but that's not even what I'm talking about here. That's just part of the process in what we do in finding the pain and getting them to tell us why they need the coverage, getting them to tell us that they don't wanna uh, move into their 401k because they're under age 59 and a half, they know all the penalties and taxes that would come along with it. That, that's them telling us that they barely have enough to get by for three months. It has to go deeper than that. And you're gonna have to hammer them a little bit more. And so I'm gonna give you a scenario of something that I see time and time again, where agents get caught up and they feel like, well, I don't wanna offer that kind of coverage because that's not why they filled out the form. They filled out the form because they have a $200,000 mortgage and they were looking for $200,000 in coverage. Now let's say for instance, this husband and wife couple, they're each late fifties, early sixties, and they each have a $250,000 term life coverage policy that has about 10 or 12 years left on it. But when you arrive onto the appointment with this husband and wife couple, you have now discovered that they are both unfortunately uninsurable. If you've been doing this long enough, can anybody relate just to that simple scenario? You have a husband and wife couple, late fifties, early sixties. They've got a big mortgage. They're looking for this type of coverage but they're uninsurable for whatever reason. Height and weight are disproportionate, laundry list of medications, pre-existing condition, combination of all three, whatever that picture looks like, this is the reality of some Americans. And some Americans, just quite frankly, by, by other standards would be uninsurable. Meaning if they tried to go through a New York Life or a Northwestern Mutual or a State Farm or one of these cookie cutter companies, they would probably either be a decline or uninsurable. Well, now they're on the phone with the, now they're on the phone with an expert, an expert who's a broker who has a buffet of carriers. But here's what we find from the agent. We find that the agent all of a sudden gets into a conversation with the husband and wife couple, and it happens. Look, it happened to me early on in my career, and I know that it's happened. If you've done enough appointments, it's happened to you where you're, you're torn between, well, the only thing that I can really offer this husband and wife couple is an MPP plan, a mortgage protection payment program, where I have to take their monthly mortgage payment, times it by a certain number of months, and that's the coverage that they're going to qualify for. Now, look, that might be um, a, a, a standard plan with Aetna might be substandard, could be graded. Hey, it could be a guaranteed issue with, with, uh, with Great Western. Maybe it's a, a, another guaranteed issue uh, with Gerber. Who knows what the carrier is based on the client situation. But I want to go back to the scenario of they have 250000 in term that's got about another 10 years left. And they both have an equal amount of coverage to keep things simple. Well, now here we are looking at a, maybe let's call it a $25,000 policy. And all of a sudden we've get this, this mind block. Something happens in our brain where we go, they're not gonna go for this. Why would they want a $25,000 policy when they have a $200,000 mortgage? That's not what they're looking for. I'm not gonna offer them this. This isn't what they asked for. And all of a sudden we start playing these mental conversations with, with ourselves. Here's where I'm gonna stop it. Here's where I'm gonna stop it. And I really wanna to talk to each of you here today, individually. And I want you to know that what you do is a service to others. And that you have to understand that it is a conceptual idea of presenting a mortgage protection payment program to somebody who already has enough coverage if they pass away to pay off that loan. But here's what we need to do, ready? Take that cap on it. I don't care how you wear it. 
You could wear it forward. You, Tanisha, you could take that cap and turn it around. That's why I wear my ball caps. That's why I wear my ball caps backwards, okay? It doesn't matter how you wear your cap, but this is where you're going to come in and you're going to hammer. And this is the conversation that you're going to have with this husband and wife couple. Here's how it goes. That $250,000 policy that you have on each other, that is meant as income replacement. See, and you can pull the statistic out and give it to somebody. The average person needs five times the other person's annual salary in order to just get by. Have any of us ever heard of the person who won $20 million and playing the lottery and five years later, they're broke, right? What do you think somebody does with 200,000? Are you kidding me? Like that, between paying off the debt, then they buy a brand new car, right? Then they pay whatever they're gonna pay. Then all of a sudden, right? Then all of a sudden, the cousin starts calling, I need 10 grand. I know, I know Uncle Bob just passed away, can you lend me 10 grand, right? And then all of a sudden, your 200 grand within a year is gone. Now what? Now, what are they left with? Now they're what? In their late 60s, early 70s, we already know they're uninsurable. Now they have no more insurance coverage left. And now the bank starts calling about that bank loan. Why? Because Mary just lost her best friend, Bob, after being married for 40 years. She just lost her best friend. Her world has been flipped upside down. She just ran through $200,000 like it was $2. And the bank's calling about the loan and she doesn't know which way to turn. And now all of a sudden she's calling her, her grandchildren asking for money, trying to figure out how she's gonna pay for her mortgage the next day. And it's an extremely uncomfortable situation. Now let's rewind. Because you were just at that house a few years ago and you didn't talk to them about MPP because you didn't think it was the right thing because they already had $200,000 in coverage. See, let's go back into the scenario. And here's how you present it. Bob, Mary, we want to leave that $200,000, that $250,000 life insurance policy alone. It's got 12 years left on it. Let's leave it for what it was meant to do. We can also agree that Mary, within about a year and a half to two years, that policy is going to be gone. You're going to pay off all the debt. You're going to pay off... Uh, uh, whatever else you know that, that you need to take care of. And it's going to be money left for you to live on, which in the grand scheme of things, how long, Mary, do you think 200000 is going to last you after you pay for the funeral, you pay off the debt, and you do whatever else you need to do with the money? How long? Okay, so you think that that's going to last you about eight to nine months? I would agree with that. So what I'm here to do is to make sure that we take a lump sum of money. Listen to me, guys. Take a lump sum of money and we wanna allocate it into a savings account so that God forbid something happens to Bob, you now have 15 months of mortgage payments coming out of this savings account as you figure it out. I like what Mike Hall said to me last night. He said, it's gonna be like Bob is making the mortgage payment from the grave. See, Bob is still helping you out, Mary. It's like Bob is still making the mortgage payment from the grave but he's only gonna do it for you for 15 months. Is 15 months enough time to give you, to pick up some of the pieces, continue to make the mortgage payment and then figure out, do you wanna stay in the house? Do you wanna sell the house? Do you wanna rent it out as a property? But is that enough time? Do you need more time? Do you think 24 months is a little bit more, uh, uh, well, do you think 24 months would be closer to the time frame that you need to stay in the house? Or do you think that your house is gonna sell really quick and you should, you'll get it uh, sold here within the next eight to 12 months? And that is where you need to really start to have belief. You need to have belief, number one, in your product. And if you don't have the product yourself, then you're doing a disservice to your client. If you don't have some sort of coverage for yourself, you're doing a disservice to, to a client. So it starts with you. It starts with your belief and it starts with your connection. And it starts with having this hard conversation with these other adults.
Because guess what? When you walk out that door or when you hang up that Zoom call or you get off that whereby link, no one else is having this kind of conversation with them. Not at their age. It's not happening. It's your opportunity to make this conversation happen. And it's your opportunity to hammer down and find out how long can they stay in the house. And then you have to build the value you have to build the value in the concept of staying in the house of 12, 15, 24 months. And they will thank you because they will understand the concept. But if we leave without a really hammering down that concept, we did a disservice. We did a disservice to the client. You hang up that Zoom and you're walking away without an, a definite, no, that's not, I don't want that. So I'm not taking that. That's not something we want. I am emphatic. I need 200,000 plus. Even though you know deep down, like, sorry, you're not going to get it. Like, I'm sorry. You're just uninsurable. Have that conversation. You're uninsurable. I have 15 carriers. We have over 65 different products. And unfortunately, you qualify for one. And that's the one I'm here to talk to you about today. It's kind of take it or leave it. So you have to have that posture, that backbone. You have to be able to have this difficult conversation, which really shouldn't be all that difficult if we're just having a lifestyle. Like this is a lifestyle conversation that you're having with somebody. So build the value in it. Here's the second thing I want to talk to you about when doing this. Dig deep in underwriting. Here's something I tell my clients all the time. Ready? If I, when we hang up this Zoom, and then I get your application over to the in-house underwriting department, am I gonna be hit with any surprises? Because I don't really like surprises because that means I gotta do my work twice. So if there's anything that you can think of, anything deep down in your history, prescription history, medical history, something in the last five years, 10 years, think about it now for a second. I'm gonna give, give you a minute. I really want you to think about it. Is there anything in your medical history that when we do a cross-reference check, it may just so happen to pop up. I know you said have allergies. Are you sure you've never taken albuterol? You've never had an inhaler for allergies? Because to them, it's allergies, but to the underwriter, it's asthma, right? I don't want any surprises. See, this is how you write clean business. This is how you get your business approved. And this is how you don't have to worry that you now have to call your client back and ask them a laundry list of questions that they forgot to tell you. It's not that they forgot, it's that you didn't dig down deep enough to figure out what do they have going on in their medical history. So just flat out ask them. Prescriptions. Now, if you get somebody up front who just says, hey, look, I'm healthy as a horse, you know, I'm in my mid thirties, never took an aspirin. I'm good to go. Okay. I get that. But if you have the person, right, that's maybe, and again, we're a field underwriter. You have to put two and two together. Maybe they're a combo. Maybe their height and weight are slightly dis a water pill, but that water pill that they take hydrochloride, whatever the, the name of that water pill is, right? I see Kyle's face, right? That water pill, well, that just so happens to also be taken for blood pressure. Oh yeah, and I forgot to tell you, I had this little AFib thing about, it, was, it wasn't a big deal. I was in and out of the hospital, okay, right? So, because to them, it's not a big deal, which maybe it really isn't, but it's our job to dig down deep and get to the bottom of the underwriting. Why? Because we are the eyes and the ears for the underwriting department. It's gonna allow you to write smoother business. And here's the last thing I'll share with you. And some of you may not even know this. And Kyle, you're probably starting to see this. When you start sending applications in to one or two or three of the same carriers, there's only so many underwriters who work at the carriers. Well, guess what? They start, to, uh, they start to hear Karen's name. They start to see Jim's name. 
All of a sudden, Janet's name starts coming across their computer screen over and over and over again. And here's what I'll share with you guys. The cleaner your business is, the more due diligence, the more notes you put in the notes section of an application, the more the underwriter starts to see you as an expert in the field, and then they stop questioning some of the applications that come through. Even if there's something on an application that might be something that's kind of teetering, they'll go, oh no, that was Doug. That was Doug Stimson. Yeah, no, he typically writes a lot of good business here. Check, approved. I'm telling you, it's the way it works. It's the way it works. You get favorable treatment. Mike Hall's shaking his head, he knows. You get favorable treatment when you start writing cleaner business and the business hits the carrier uh, and, you, and you use the same two or three carriers over and over again, right? It's not about what we write, it's about what gets paid. And so I hope uh, that these were some tips for you here today uh, that helps you become a better field underwriter, uh, whether you're doing virtual or you know, you're talking to somebody face-to-face, -face, um, it all counts, it all counts. So